Uh, I can remember, uh, it was almost 10 years ago, standing outside in the pouring rain. I had a copy of Field and Stream magazine, and I was looking through this article, trying to learn how to butcher a deer with a magazine article in the pouring rain. And it was a bit of a mess, but the end product was delicious. And 10 years later, we've never made ourselves sick. <laughs> we've eaten real good food and we've saved money doing it. And one of the biggest reasons I think you should consider learning how to butcher is because it's an easy way for someone who wants to live the homestead dream to save some money to put towards that homestead dream and to learn a skill that they will use later on when they're homesteading, if they're going to be raising animals for meat. We used to sell pigs. We used to raise whole pigs to sell to people in our community. I would raise a whole pig and then I would go and bring that pig to the butcher. And believe it or not, about half of the cost associated with having that pig wind up on someone's table was from the butchering. Every year, we like to raise three pigs for our own family. We, we raise one to do a pig roast here on the farm with our friends and family. And then we raise two more, which we have taken to the butcher, cut up, and we leave that in the freezer to feed our family of six. For our own pigs, we have to pay for all the feed, all the hay and, and grain, and we also have to pay for the butcher fees, which adds on an additional expense. Butchering is an art, it's a skill. Uh, I loved my butcher, I loved working with him. The guy was a master, and he earned every penny. I was glad to pay what we paid. But if you were a customer of mine, and I told you that you could probably save about half of the cost, you might consider learning how to butcher. So tonight we're going to get into that. Why you might want to butcher, how you could save money doing it, and how you can learn. We'll talk a little bit about equipment. We have a very special guest that I want to introduce. Our guest tonight is Jamie Waldron. He was born in Windsor, Ontario. He started his career as a small country butcher in a butcher shop as a teenager. And since then, he spent over 18 years, almost two decades, working in the art of butchery. Uh, Jamie has worked at some of the top butcher shops in Canada, helped craft menus and meat programs for restaurant groups, consulted for butcher shops. And in 2013, he wrote the Home Butchering Handbook. It covers all aspects of traditional meat cutting from whole carcass to usable cuts. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about exploring the world of home butchery, how it can greatly increase your home economy by taking control of how you purchase meat, uh, providing you with more flexibility by purchasing whole carcasses. Uh, this is something that we have been doing for years, whether it's for animals we raised ourselves, uh, dealing with whole carcasses. Uh, it kind of opens up the world of different kinds of meats, different kinds of cuts, and trying to figure out what you're going to do with it. Jamie's going to help us out tonight. So, Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Jamie, I'm really excited about talking tonight because I was that guy uh, with a Field and Stream magazine who didn't know the first thing about what he was doing. Uh, that's how I got started 10 years ago, just kind of DIY butchering. How did you wind up where you are today, Jamie? Well, uh, let's see. So, right out of high school, I was just kind of like, your typical directionless kid. I needed a job. Uh, some friends of mine were working in a small butcher shop and they asked me if I wanted to help out. I did. Um, that led to uh, like a little bit of credential to in order to kind of like get a job somewhere else. So I ended up uh, in the big city of Windsor, Ontario. This is all Canada, by the way. And uh, I get hired at uh, uh, the local kind of independent grocery store, uh, Remark Farms. And I end up working there for, oh my, a long time and I kind of <laughs> climb my way through the ranks. I start on poultry for a number of years uh, and then I gradually kind of work my way up to working on pork and a little bit of lamb and a little bit of beef. I tried tried very hard not to fall into the butchery career. It was something that I just kind of fought against for the vast majority of my career. So when I was younger, um, I think that because a lot of my friends were in like dabbling in the vegetarian world and um, you know, their diet, I think kind of crept into my psyche and I just kind of felt 
that maybe this wasn't the right line of work. I had some I had some moral wrestling that I had to do in order to kind of like come to terms with the fact that this was the job that I was doing. And again, it was honestly, it was a job for me. I wasn't really kind of immersed in it when I first started. Um, it was something that paid the bills and allowed me to, uh, you know, move out of my parents' house. Uh, and it wasn't until probably like 2007 um, I fell victim to the, the food network fad and uh, all the hype around that and got really excited about food. Uh, so, I mean, I guess it's not a bad thing. So, uh, finding myself really excited about food, I thought, how can I best kind of be a part of that world? And you know what, working in a kitchen was not going to be that job. No way. I couldn't do it. The hours were insane. I wanted to have some sort of like a real kind of like genuine existence that didn't include like late nights and, you know, all the things and the baggage that go around along with being a chef. So I thought, well, you know what, butchery is it. I'm going back in. So I <laughs> found myself back in butchery, and in 2007, I actually applied for a job and got uh, working at Cumbrae's uh, just outside of Toronto. Um, and for your listeners who may not know that name, they've got two, soon to be three, very successful shops in, in Toronto proper, and then they've got a smaller butcher shop in Dundas, which is about an hour outside of Toronto. I took the smaller shop job in and then just kind of like immersed myself in it. Uh, they were bringing in whole carcasses. Uh, I went on my own time to learn how to break carcasses uh, and spent a lot of time just researching and reading because, I mean, as you may or may not know, there's not a lot of valuable resources online. That's starting to change. We can talk about that if you like, but it is starting to change. Um, but I plugged myself into books and I've got a reading list a mile long of all the different books I read and just, again, immersed myself, whether it was reading, reading, reading so much information that I could possibly consume. And then starting, it started to affect the way that I saw things and how I envisioned uh, the career path that I could take. It didn't necessarily mean that I needed to just be, and no offense to them, like a supermarket butcher who just kind of punches in and punches out in the afternoon. Like this is, this is something that occupies a great deal of my time and that I, I spend a lot of time doing. So yeah, that's uh if for the person who like me is I'm never, I've never want to be a butcher as a, as a job. I never want to make money doing that. What I do like to do and I do enjoy is taking an animal that I've raised here on the farm and turning that into something beautiful for my family to eat or, you know, taking a deer from the woods and, and, feeding that to my family. I enjoy turning that, you know, that that carcass, that basic product into something that's delicious, uh, something that changes people's minds. Ooh, yeah. Oh yeah, look at that. Good sear. The power I've found of serving food uh, that's done correctly, that's prepared the right way. I've had people who were totally against hunting do a 180 because they saw how how I handled you know the hunting side of things and how good the meat was. Uh, farm fresh food, you know, small ag. Having people taste pork for the first time that was raised in my backyard versus what the pork chops that they're used to. That. <sighs> That's like a hunter's gift. Tenderloins for breakfast the next morning in a skillet with steak and eggs. I'm tempted to just eat it out of the skillet like Cracker Barrel does. Oh yeah. Ooh, I'm, I might just eat it out of the skillet. <laughs> So for someone like me who, who really just wants to do it as kind of a hobby level, what's a good place for someone like me to start? Good question. Um, I think, again, as we spoke about uh, the online availability of teaching and learning, um, there's some great people online. Uh, Scott Ray comes to mind. He's a great guy to check out. He's got a whole channel. Uh, the Urban Butchery channel is another one where you can find a lot of different videos on there that are very well produced. Um, so those are a couple of good resources. If you don't have the availability of uh, like a guy like me who's just kind of teaching classes to the general public, I would say that those are two great places to start. Um, you may have a butcher shop that may enjoy having some free labor around. Volunteer work is powerful. Like uh, it would be very hard to pass that up. So I think that those those two options would be a good place to start. Um, and then books like. 
and I'm not here to plug mine. Um, there's lots of really good ones out there. We can talk, you know, at length about the different books that are out there too. There's a lot of good resources right now. Um, nothing trumps uh, knife in hand with a skilled person beside you showing you how to do it. But in lieu of that, I would say, yeah, books, online, uh, and volunteer work. I think those are probably three pretty good leads. If you were going to suggest an animal to start cutting, right? Um, even if it's not one that someone has raised, because I think one of the best things about the skill of butchering is someone who has a dream to homestead, who's like, oh, I would love to homestead, but I can't do it right now, could do this. This is not impossible for anybody who has a table and a knife, right? So um, what would you suggest for someone just starting off? What's the animal to get started on? Uh, whole chickens. Why is yeah, that, Yeah, absolutely. Jamie? They're in it. They're inexpensive, um, and just what you can glean from a whole chicken is there's zero waste. I mean, there's ultimately there shouldn't be very much waste in anything that you're cutting up, but a chicken provides you with, you know, you take the wings off, you take the breasts off, you take the legs off, you bone out the breasts, and then you've got all these bones left for a stock. So at the end of it, even if you've totally botched it and it looks like a nightmare, you can still just put all of that into a stock pot and at least get a chicken noodle soup out of it. So, you know what I mean? Like the learning curve is point. there. Like yep. you, it's a huge learning curve. Um, again, there's so many resources online that you can walk through it step by step, just over and over. I would say probably by the time you've done four or five, if you're, you know, gonna gonna fill your freezer for the, you know, a few weeks, buy four or five chickens. It'll cost you less than a hundred bucks, and I bet you by the fourth or fifth one, you've got a pretty good handle on what you're doing. That's that's such a good place to start too. I think because we talk, we're talking about um, with small scale agriculture. There's a lot of people out there looking to sell pastured poultry, right? Jamie, you mentioned you do classes on on butchery. Is that where you usually start people? Is that where you suggest they start a class with chicken? Yeah. So <laughs> you know the the pork popular one because everybody wants to. I think I think it's a couple of things. They want to feel like they're um, maybe breaking down something that's a little bit more big. Uh, so it's not a chicken. I think that there's like some sort of masculinity thing going on too, where <laughs> guys are like, I'm not going to break down a chicken. I want to break down this pig and I'm going to learn how to do that. Right. Be that what it may. Uh, the pork one always seems to trump regardless of, um, like you know, the, the gender that's there. Sometimes it's 50, 50. Sometimes there's more women than men. It's, it's pretty interesting, but, uh, like the poultry classes don't normally sell quite as well as the pork classes. I would highly suggest, and I've had this conversation with a lot of the people that that do take the pork class. It's just like they're like, "Oh, let's let's do a beef class," and, I, and then again, I have to kind of steer the ship. And I say, you know what? Honestly, you should probably just take a chicken class because that's going to be way more applicable in the home kitchen. Like, how often yeah. are you going to go and buy a side of beef and try to do that in your home? Right? It's that's just like, such no, a good it, point. What's, what's the reality? What are you going to bring home and do? Like, I get it. Like, there's the whole. You know, as much as I don't like the word, but it, it enters into the equation a lot, it's like the experience of it, right? So everybody's yeah. looking for an experience these days. And I get it. You want to break down a cow? It's a wonderful experience, but it has zero practicality. Like, you're never going to do that again. Yeah. So in, in the situation for your listeners, uh, people who are aspiring homesteaders or experienced homesteaders, it's like the reality is, is that we have to start somewhere. And a chicken might be a good place to start. What do you see as far as educating the public about butchering uh, where the food's coming from why is that important jamie what do you see that doing if it's people that are taking a hands-on class i find that there's certainly is two different camps so sometimes when i've done like a, a dinner demonstration that's something totally different people might be there out of curiosity to find out where the tenderloin comes from or yeah. something like that but the people that are there uh, with their hands into the work those are the people that at the end of it there's always an aha moment when I bring up the fact that there's a pride of ownership in the work that they're doing too, that, the, that they actually had an active part in putting the food on the table that they're going to prepare for their loved ones. So I think that's very powerful. And then just the sheer amount of meat that they take home is just is so overwhelming to them too. Like they never really thought of the yield. Um, and I'll, I'll steal a phrase from a, a fellow out on the, uh, the West coast of the States. He always says it's the burden of abundance because there literally is so much. And I don't think that people are aware that when you buy a whole pig or a side of uh, pork that you just yield so much meat. There's so much that goes along with it because there is zero waste. And it's, I always say, okay, we'll take, take inventory of what's on the table right now. It's a side of pork. 
maybe it weighs 80 to 100 pounds. And then after it, when it's all wrapped up and portioned out and there's literally a mound of meat on the table and bags of bones and fat and skin that's all usable, people go, oh my goodness, this is crazy. We never <laughs> knew. And then, and then we start exploring topics like the cost, like we've already kind of briefly touched on and we can uh, get into again too. It's just like the cost. And they always say, how much did this cost? How much if I wanted to do this? What, what? And then the wheels start turning about savings and all this other stuff. So the people that are immersed in the hands-on workshops certainly walk away with uh, a better understanding of where their food comes from, where the cuts are on the animal, um, the savings, the savings, the savings. Oh my goodness. And uh, yeah. And just again, pride of ownership over producing that cut that they're eventually going to serve to someone that they know. I think, I think that's, that's huge. So you talked about the savings that someone, their eyes kind of open up. They're sitting there learning from you how to cut up the pig. Look at how much you get. Here's all the bacon. Here's all the you know what's going to become sausage oh wow here's all the lard right i didn't even know what lard was but now i got a whole pile of it i got to figure out something to do with it and then they start learning about oh well I, i'm saving here and i'm saving there explain to us what does someone what are they seeing if someone's never had this experience before what kind of savings are they going to start to see how does taking control of this end of the meat process help somebody right there in their own home kitchen. Every time a butcher has to put a knife, pick up a knife and touch the piece of meat that you're going to take home, it costs you money. So the bigger piece that you can bring home and perform the task on it yourself is saving you dollars and cents. Um, and when we're talking about like the whole pig and you're saying there's all of this meat and all of this meat, um, I think that once you've purchased it and you start working on it, you also have this like moral dilemma of actually throwing anything in the garbage too. So there's all those things that go along with it. But let's say for instance that you go out and you buy a chicken for, I mean, a well-raised pasture chicken. I don't know. I don't know what the prices are like in here. Let's say $15, right? I'll, I would wager that if you wanted just a boneless, skinless breast off of that, it might cost you $20. So there, there's your savings. You've saved yourself $5 on buying a whole chicken, but now you've got a drumstick, a thigh, you know, wings and the bones for the stock. We cannot overstate that. And now you've actually got the skin left on the breast too, which is like the best part of the whole thing. Why people <laughs> discard that is beyond me. So I would say that, you know, that cutting test, a basic cutting test on a chicken for my world, it's just like you start off with a chicken that, you've, that, that costs probably about $10, let's say. Let's say that you are able to secure those from a grower for $10. All of a sudden, that boneless, skinless breast that you would have paid $20 for now has cost you 10 And again, like all those things that you've gotten along the way. So all of the profits that a butcher shop or a grocery store are making off of them bringing in those pieces and breaking them down yourselves, if you develop those skills, you've already just saved yourself probably about 30 or $40. And if you had to go and buy two legs, two wings, bones, and boneless skinless breast, you bought all those things separately, you're probably paying at least 50% more of what you would have bought that whole chicken for and done it yourself. So let's, let's do a little bit of conservative math here. You said you could save 10 bucks on purchasing a whole chicken. And let's say one family every week, and this is probably for most families a super underestimate, but between the whole chicken, the you know, the drumsticks and the breasts and the thighs, let's say they eat one chicken a week. If you're saving $10, we got 50 weeks in the year, that's $500. People say all the time, oh, I can't afford organic. I can't afford local food. I can't afford the farmer's market. Well, it's hard. If, if you learn these skills, it would be really hard to argue that anymore. It would be really hard to say, I can't afford it. We've saved $500 on the chicken. Now let's say we learn, we, let's say we eat a little bit more. Let's say we eat two chickens a week. That's $1,000 a year, right? <laughs> Off our grocery yeah. bill. And, and that's $1,000 a year to a family like mine with a lot of kids, every month, a hundred bucks is a lot of money back in my pocket. A hundred bucks to go towards the farm out here. I could take that thousand dollars, everyone, oh, I can't afford, I can't afford. Well, if I saved a thousand dollars a year by butchering two chickens a week myself, I can now feed a whole group of chickens for less than a thousand dollars. I essentially now can like raise my own chicken and process it and actually have earned money 
even though nobody handed me that dollar, the money I've saved, it's like putting money right back in my pocket. So people who say I can't afford to eat organic or I can't afford to eat local, well, could you learn a skill that would enable you to do it? People who say, oh, I can't homestead, I don't have the money, I'm in debt. This is a really easy, I shouldn't say easy, but this is a very clear path uh, towards saving the money to making what you want happen. You want a homestead, mm -hmm. but you can't afford it? Learn this skill because you're going to need it anyway later on. Um, you want to eat better, but you can't afford it? Learn this skill. Absolutely um, a huge amount of money that you're going to be saving by learning to do this yourself mm. that you then can apply elsewhere to your other passions. For a lot of people in our audience, it's, hey, I want to grow this animal. So a lot of us think I have to raise the chicken first and then I can learn to butcher it. But no, take a class like Jamie puts on. If you could catch one of Jamie's, he travels a lot. <laughs> but if not, find somebody who's doing, even if there's no classes, find somebody who does it. And like Jamie said, uh, offer to help. We've had a lot of chicken butcher days. And I promise you, anybody who said to me, hey, Aust, I want to help you come process chickens, I never told them no. I always said, get over here as soon as you can. I will work you all day long. I will send you home with one chicken. Believe it or not, that's all I can afford to give away. <laughs> but they would learn the skills and then they would take that elsewhere. Uh, so such a mm -hmm. so much savings there, Jamie. It really is. It's just such a good all around thing for someone to learn how to do. As long as you have the space for a cutting board and a knife. Honestly, that's it. Like, honestly, like I marvel again my students just like just can't can't get over it they think that it's supposed to be this like huge technological wonder child of a room that butchery is performed in but here's the reality and i just brought these here this is this is all i need to get through a pig I've oh i was hoping you'd have something knife here and i've got a six inch boning knife and this my other prize possession which is uh, this 19 inch saw that's it those three pieces of equipment and i'm good i get through a whole pig that's it that's it. So the investment here, I would say, is about $100 all in total and start your and start your journey. That's awesome. It, it really, I mean, it couldn't be simpler than that. Do you have any suggestions as far as um, brands, uh, you know, gear-wise? If someone's buying knives, do you have a favorite brand someone could look to, you know, that you would say this is the one to get started with if you can afford it? Where should someone go with that, Jamie? So, um Knives, I would be a little bit uh, hesitant to just say, go pick up the cheapest one that you can find. No, that's that's not going to help you out. You're going to find that the, 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 the edge will dull quickly and it'll just become useless to you, right? A sharp knife is your best friend. So I prefer uh, a Victorinox knife. Um, they make them in all different shapes and sizes, but I use a six inch straight edge boning knife. Um, and then I use an eight inch breaking knife, which is the exact same model as the six inch knife, but just two extra inches on it. And that provides me all the knife work that I'll need. Um, and you can find all that stuff on Amazon or any type of like uh, butcher supply that would ship to your area. And then the saw, uh, if you have a Cabela's, uh, a Bass Pro, uh, uh, here we use um, Princess Auto as a popular one. All of these stores will have uh, a hunting section more often than not. And you can find a hand saw there. Um, and you can find all the different spices and all the other thing. Like honestly, once you open up your eyes to it, the world is your oyster. But uh, just to get started with a six inch boning knife, again, a Victorian ox in my preference, there's many different shapes and sizes uh, and, and a saw. And I think that those two things in particular is like starting you off on your journey for sure. <laughs> Honestly, it's just a matter of just getting in there because yeah, you might be on the fence about it. And I don't know, people come at it for all different reasons or want to get into it for all different reasons or don't want to do it for all different reasons. I'm not here to judge why anybody wants to do anything like that. But if you have the inclination the information is out there for you. Take me as <laughs> a prime example, as someone who researched tirelessly. The information is out there and it's not even remotely hard to find. Go to YouTube and type in butchery. My God, the videos will like <laughs> astound you. So honestly, if you have any hesitation, the information is there, the know-how is there, the, the learning curve may exist, but keep on at it. Honestly, it's not, it's not rocket science. I don't wanna like discredit what butchers do all over the world, but it, it's not impossible. I want everyone to think that they can do it. It's not impossible. That's awesome advice, Jamie. Uh, this has been a fantastic interview. Uh, I hope it inspires a couple out there to jump in and try it themselves. Uh, before you go, Jamie, I want a, a couple books. Give us a reading list for someone who wants to get started. 
and then tell us about your book and tell us where else people can find you, uh, whether they're looking to take a class, just want to pick your brain, you know, find you on the internet, send us off with some homework. No problem. Um, so the book that changed my life, honestly, like I say that unequivocally, was the River Cottage Meat book. Um, it is a wealth of knowledge and even after all these years, it's still very relevant. Um, a book that really kind of impacted me that came out within the past year is uh, the Meet the Ultimate Companion, uh, written by Anthony Paharich, uh, who owns Victor Churchill in Sydney, Australia. Uh, it's a very well laid out book, very well put together. Uh, Adam Danforth has two really, really amazing books. Uh, one just solely on beef butchery from beginning to end. And there's another one that covers poultry, pork and lamb. Those books are James Beard award winning books. They are fantastic. They just did a marvelous job. Um, those are three. And I think that that's a pretty good place to start. Uh, my book uh, came out in 2013 and I wrote it with a lovely woman in the States. Her name's Angela England. And uh, it just covers all of the things that we've just been waxing on all hour, like home butchery. Uh, where to start, uh, where all the cuts come from, and how you can do it at home. It's uh, very photo orientated, so something that was certainly would be appealing to somebody wanting to learn. Um, so I think that you can find that on generally all the kind of major platforms like Amazons and Barnes and Nobles and so on and so forth. Um, and then where can you find me? Great question. Uh, Jay Waldron Butchers is uh, where I do the vast majority of my kind of legwork on social media and I have a Facebook page that is also under the same name of Jay Waldron Butchers and if you search either platform it will lead you in those directions. For those of you who are watching live we do have some live guests who've been enjoying this whole show Jamie. If you do have any questions for Jamie now's the time fire them off in the chat box and I'll read them to him. Uh, I would want to make sure while you're here that we don't miss any questions. And I'm also going to check my email inbox uh, because once in a while people will in email me a question for our guest. And I don't see any yet. Uh, let's see. Maybe we talked about everything. <laughs> I think that's what it was, Jamie. We were so <laughs> thorough. There are no <laughs> questions. Uh, so, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will put the links to Jamie's book. Jamie's social media and everything else down below in the comment section. Once this hits YouTube, you will be able to find all that information uh, that Jamie shared with us, his reading list, his book, his social media. So if you got a question for him or you just want to follow him, I've been following him on Instagram. A lot of good stuff coming out there from uh, just pictures that are going to inspire you, uh, things that are going to make you think. I really enjoyed that post I was looking at that he shared about how uh, sadly butchers are paid a lot less than their counterparts, whether they're <laughs> carpenters uh, or somebody else of a different trade, plumbers. I came from a trade background. I feel like good hard work always deserves to get uh, treated, you know, as that good hard work. And if you, if you've ever, I know from just doing it at a hobby level, cutting up an animal is hard work. If you learn what you're doing, if you read a book, Jamie's book or any of those that he suggested, and you get any good at it at all, it's something you can be really, really proud of. Uh, that my some of my proudest moments as a homesteader have come from being in touch with start to finish one animal that I saw it take its first meal, I fed it its last, and then I turned it into something that I knew would be delicious. Uh, to be honest, my wife is the one who makes it delicious. I usually get it to the to the kitchen and she takes it from there. Uh, but you really can feel really proud kind of being hands-on in that whole process. And if you're new to this and you have been withdrawn from every part of that process, if you're not at the homestead yet, if you don't have the animals yet, if it's something you're dreaming about, Jamie really laid out tonight how you can save money, uh, learn a life skill and eat better than you can elsewhere. Uh, by learning the skill of butchery and that is something you could do tomorrow. You literally tomorrow could just go down to the supermarket. If that's where you've been buying your chicken all these years, don't stop tomorrow. Go down to the supermarket, buy yourself a whole chicken and uh, start cutting that whole chicken up with uh, one of these good information sources at your side. And who knows, by, maybe by next year we'll be able to have you on the show as our interview about cutting. <laughs> Probably take a little longer than that, Jamie might say, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll inspire somebody here, Jamie, that'll take it pretty far. Anybody who's watching live, we have another live show coming up. Uh, Greg Judy's gonna be joining us soon to talk about raising livestock. Uh, so make sure to join us for that. And uh, we'll have information, we'll be emailing you uh, for upcoming show dates 
and uh, letting you know so that you don't miss out on any of our good shows. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in the next live show. Hey, you're still watching. I think that means you really like this episode. You actually only saw half of this interview. Jamie went on to talk about butchering pigs. Um, and when we were talking about like the whole pig and you were saying there's all of this meat and all of this meat. How much money you could save doing so. While that may seem like an extraordinary amount of money for $1,000 for a whole pig, that's still 220 pounds of meat. What special cuts you could actually get yourself if you did the butchering that you might not be able to buy at the supermarket. A pork brisket and people go, what? <laughs> it's, it's almost like it never occurred to them that a pork has this, that same pectoral muscle that a cow has, just on a smaller scale. And a whole lot more. Click here to become a Homesteady Pioneer. You'll get access to the entire library of the extended versions of our shows. And you can join us live for the next one. Ask questions of our next guest. $5 a month. Click here to become a Pioneer.